Good morning and welcome to worship coming to you from the chapel at Portland's First United Methodist Church, where we are a reconciling congregation, a peace church, and a creation care congregation. And we are so glad that you have chosen to be in worship with us this morning. Joining me in the chapel today is the Reverend Ethan Gregory, who will be bringing us the message of the day. Shelley Edwards on the piano, Jonathan Green, our soloist, and our tech team, Lindsay McGill and Jean Balcom, without whom this would not be possible. I want to share with you just a couple of announcements before we begin. Because this is the week of Thanksgiving, and we hope that everyone will be prepared for a safe and joyous day on Thursday, we are going to be taking Wednesday off, so no prayer group Wednesday morning and no pastor's Bible study Wednesday evening. Both of those things will resume in the following week. Also, I want to remind you that um, there is a art exhibit which is focusing on human migration. It's called Hope in Every Step. And this is a part of a collaborative effort from seven churches in the downtown Portland area. The actual physical exhibit will be presented next fall. But right now you can get a preview by going to our website, www.fumcpdx.org slash hope in every step. And now, my friends, as Ethan lights the Christ candle for us, we are reminded of the presence of God in our midst. And I would invite you to light a candle wherever you may be worshiping today, that you might focus your attention and bring your whole self into this time of worship. And then I invite you to share the peace of Christ with whomever you worship with today or even with yourself 
knowing that that peace extends from this chapel throughout the world. You're invited to take out a phone or a tablet and send a brief message to someone far away, telling them, reminding them of the peace of Christ in their midst as well. Let us worship. How majestic is your name in all the earth. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O oh Lord, we praise your name. O oh Lord, we magnify your name. Prince of peace, mighty God. O oh Lord, Majestic is your name in all the earth. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O oh Lord, we praise your name. O oh Lord, we magnify your name. Prince of peace, mighty God. O oh Lord, God of Please join me now in the responsive call to worship that you'll find printed in the bulletin. Today is a day for thanksgiving, for remembering all of the ways in which we are loved by, in, and with our God. Let us lift up our hearts with gratitude for God's abundant grace. Today is a day for declaring, for bearing witness to the truth that Christ is the one who sits on the throne that cannot be found in a palace, but instead among God's people. Let us lift up our voices with shouts of honor and praise. Today is a day for rejoicing, for discerning and discovering who we are and what we can become when we share our gifts with one another. Let us rejoice. Now more than ever, we must rejoice over this place we call home. Friends, as we continue our worship today, let us enter into prayer together. We rejoice indeed, O oh God. We rejoice for this season, this week of thanksgiving and gratitude for friends, for family, and for neighbors. But most importantly, we give thanks for all that we have and all that we are through your great love and through the way of following you and your Son, Christ Jesus. And so as we give thanks in our worship, help us to do so through our praying, our singing, and our entering into your story. We pray all this in the name of the one who is love. Amen. My strength when I am weak, you are the treasure that I seek, you are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, or to give up I'd be a fool, you are my all in all. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God. Lamb of God, 
Friends, today we wrap up our November worship series, Grateful, the series in which we've been exploring themes of grace and gratitude and giving thanks for all that we have and all that God does with and in our lives. Today, as we conclude, we do so through the letter to the church at Ephesus. This was a, one of the later letters in the New Testament written towards the end of the first century. Sometimes it gets attributed to the Apostle Paul, but since it was written so much later, we think it wasn't written by him. There are a number of discrepancies, uh, some of the phrasing that's used, some of the actual theological ideas are a bit different from Paul's other letters. And so with this book, this book that's written not to a specific church, but to just the church, we enter into this story today and give thanks and so hear these words. Since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, this is the reason that I don't stop giving thanks to God for you when I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, will give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation that makes God known to you. I pray that the eyes of your heart will have enough light to see what is the hope of God's call, what is the richness of God's glorious inheritance among believers, and what is the overwhelming greatness of God's power that is working among us believers. This power is conferred by the energy of God's powerful strength. God's power was at work in Christ when God raised him from the dead and sat him at God's right side in the heavens far above every ruler and authority and power and angelic power, any power that might be named not only now but in the future. God put everything under Christ's feet and made him head of everything in the church, which is his body. His body, the church, is the fullness of Christ who fills everything in every way. May God bless our reading, hearing, and responding to Scripture. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh God, open our hearts and minds by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that as the Scripture has been read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us this day. Amen. For the last couple of years, we as a society have been fortunate enough in this month of November, that the good people at Netflix have blessed us with seasons three and four of their original show, The Crown. This magnificent work of television dives deep into the reign of Queen Elizabeth II, her extended family, the royal family, and their relationship to British history throughout her time on the throne. Season four was released last Sunday, and I will admit that in a particularly full week of work and ministry, including prep for our second party pickup event and worship prep for not one but two weekends worth of worship, I managed to find within, find within my schedule the time to watch all 10 hour-long episodes. With each new season of this show, I always come away learning something new about the royal family and of historical events of the 20th century that I had not really known anything about. Without giving up any spoilers, this season's learnings centered around Princess Diana and her less-than-stellar marriage to Prince Charles, and also around Margaret Thatcher and her service for over a decade as the first female British Prime Minister. However, in addition to the entertainment and learning that each new season of The Crown brings, it also seems to always help put into perspective the liturgical holiday that we come to celebrate on this Sunday each November. 
Today is Christ the King Sunday. It's a day in the life of the church that marks a transition. The end of the long season after Easter and Pentecost that we refer to as ordinary time. The celebration that yet again another church year has ended, and the notice that just as quickly as this one is ending, an extra ordinary time that we call Advent is right on its way. But this day also serves as a reminder. A reminder that before there were creeds, before there were theologians, before there was church structure, rules, policies, and procedures, there was a confession. Three words. Jesus is Lord. The crown always helps me to put these words into perspective. Because as fascinating as Queen Elizabeth, Prince Philip, Princess Margaret, and the rest of their family seems to be, they are nowhere near representative of the leadership and management of the kingdom of heaven. And thanks be to God, Jesus is not that kind of queen or king. Instead of in a palace hiding away from the people, Jesus is the kind of king that gets his hands dirty outside living, moving, and having his being with and among God's people. Instead of putting on a front, a fake smile, or signaling the appearance of perfection, Jesus is the embodiment of perfection through the way that he loves God and loves his neighbor. And instead of holding on to power no matter the cost, Jesus spares no expense in order that power can be shared equity can be achieved, and justice and righteousness can be done. Jesus is Lord, but he is a different kind of Lord entirely. Today's reading from Ephesians puts it in this way. God's power was at work in Christ when God raised him from the dead and sat him at God's right side in the heavens far above every ruler and authority and power and angelic power and power that might be named not only now but in the future. God put everything under Christ's feet and made him head of everything in the church, which is his body. His body, the church, is the fullness of Christ, who fills everything in every way. If there was any doubt, The author of Ephesians makes it clear that Jesus is the ultimate authority. No king or queen, emperor or chancellor, president or prime minister is above him. In many ways, this language is comforting. As human beings, we are prone to like and think about the world in terms of hierarchy and the chain of command. We often think about relationships and structures from the top down. Ephesians has the unique perspective of being at least one, possibly even two generations removed from Jesus and the disciples, from Paul and the first Christians in the early church. And as tended to happen throughout the church's history, this has meant that special attention is increasingly given to power and to position. The original use of the phrase, Jesus is Lord, did not imply rank or position. The full sentence was simply, Jesus is Lord and Caesar is not. The implication was not about which kingdoms are better or greater than others. The implication was instead much more hopeful, much more immediate, and much more meaningful for how, as Christians, we are to live our lives in the day today, in the here and now. By saying that Jesus is Lord and Caesar is not, the early church was saying that the kingdom of heaven is not out there or up there with its own territories, borders, and power structures. But instead, the early church was saying that the kingdom of heaven is here, right here, right now, right where we are. The throne room of the kingdom of heaven isn't something that a person has to have the right status to visit or to make an appointment to come and see, but is something that each of us steps foot into each and every day. The priest, author, and teacher Richard Rohr captures this understanding of the kingdom of heaven in this way. 
The kingdom of heaven is really a metaphor for a state of consciousness. It is not a place you go to, but a place you come from. It is a whole new way of looking at the world, a transformed awareness that literally turns this world into a different place. The hallmark of this awareness is that it sees no separation, not between God and humans, not between humans and other humans. And these are indeed Jesus' two core teachings, underlying everything he says and everything he does. The author of Ephesians may have been slightly removed from this initial concept and understanding of Jesus and God's kingdom, but not entirely. The first half of today's reading captures this point well. Since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, this is the reason that I don't stop giving thanks to God for you when I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, will give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation that makes God known to you. I pray that the eyes of your heart will have enough light to see what is the hope of God's call, what is the richness of God's glorious inheritance among believers, and what is the overwhelming greatness of God's power that is working among us. Friends, as Christians now removed over 2,000 years from the first Christians in the early church, we've inherited quite a bit throughout the church's history. Some of it not so great. Some theology that we should keep putting our minds to and keep coming back to the whiteboard about. Some of it utterly atrocious and reprehensible. The Crusades and other countless acts of violence. Some of it we still have quite a bit of work to do to repent of. Using scripture to justify the oppression of other people and the multitude of ways in which we seek to cling on to our own power. Nevertheless, despite the church's unimaginable flaws and grand mistakes, the eyes of our hearts keep receiving enough light to see that a glorious inheritance, in fact, really does remain. We somehow manage to still have the ability on our better days to step into and see the kingdom of heaven, to confess not with our lips, but rather with our deeds and our thoughts and our actions that Jesus is Lord, and to partner with Christ in countless acts of love and justice in the world. Four weeks ago, we started this series, Grateful with a reminder from Donna that the words gratitude and grateful have their roots in the word grace, the unconditional love that God has for each and every one of us. And so, friends, it's no accident that over and over again, we get to keep trying, we get to keep doing, we get to keep hoping and seeing the eyes of our hearts, and we get to keep receiving the glorious inheritance that is the love of our God in Christ Jesus. For the last several weeks, as we've been in the midst of our 2021 stewardship campaign, now more than ever, I've had the joy of collecting stories for a series of videos to convey just how much, in this moment, that God needs us, and how much we need this place called the First United Methodist Church of Portland. And in each of these stories, it's abundantly clear that no matter what this year has brought us, God's kingdom is continuing to unfold in our midst. What a glorious inheritance this is. Stories about the lift up food pantry, how use of the pantry is up 60%, how its shelves continue to remain stocked, how volunteers keep showing up, what a glorious inheritance. Stories about the soon-to-open PSU landing at FUMC, how dreams about using our space were dreamed, how funds have been raised, how students will have a place to sleep. What a glorious inheritance. 
Stories about children, youth, and their families who love their church, the worship, the music, the people, the community that exists here. What a glorious inheritance. Stories about small groups and Bible studies that have formed online, of making new friends, meeting new people, and building new relationships. What a glorious inheritance. Stories about sacred circles and a renewed sense of the work of racial justice in our community, in our state, in our nation. What a glorious inheritance. And stories of phone calls, text messages, handwritten cards, and far more pastoral care than can be done by any one person on their own. What a glorious inheritance. The words of Charles Wesley help to bear witness to this truth. Christ's kingdom cannot fail. Christ rules over earth and heaven. The keys of earth and hell are to our Jesus given. Lift up your heart. Lift up your voice. Rejoice. Rejoice again, I say, rejoice. Friends, there is no doubt that Jesus Christ is our Lord and that Christ's kingdom is right here, right now, in this place. May we keep rejoicing over this glorious inheritance. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, this is the time in worship when we are given a tangible opportunity to make a response to the God that we have met in this time of worship together. You can bring an offering into the work of this church by sending a check to the church office, by making an offering through the online giving platform of the website, or by sending a text message. As we prepare to receive the offering, let us pray together. O oh, gracious and holy God, now more than ever, you call us into the work of your kingdom, the sharing of your love, the working toward justice, the proclaiming your righteousness. Now more than ever, Lord, you need us to be engaged in this work. And now more than ever, we need one another as partners, collaborators, as those who we can rely upon together to bring your kingdom into fulfillment in the name of Christ. Amen. Blessings flow, praise God, all creatures here below. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise God, the source of all our gifts. Praise Jesus Christ, whose power uplifts. Praise the 
Spirit, Holy Spirit, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Friends, we enter now into the time in our service in which we continue to respond to the God whom we have met in worship this day. You may wish to have a journal or your own candles near you during this time. As we begin, we journey first to our prayer station. The music will play. A number of candles will be lit. And as each one is lit, you are invited to lift up a prayer for a certain person, a certain event, or just generally to give thanks for all that God continues to give us in this season. And so let us enter into prayer together. We come next to the wisdom wall. As the camera pans through each of these quotes, you're invited to read them, reflect, and take in their wisdom. Note that if you need more time on a particular quote, feel free to click pause on YouTube. come next to the contemplation corner. Reflect on this painting reminding us of Christ the King Sunday, and hear these words from the Iona prayer book. Alleluia, alleluia. Speak, Jesus, word of God. It is your turn to speak. Brother who speaks truth to his sisters and brothers, give us your new freedom. Free from profit, free from fear. We will live in gospel. We will shout in gospel. Alleluia, alleluia. 
No power will silence us. Alleluia, alleluia. Against the orders of hate, you bring us the law of love. In the face of so many lies, you are the truth out loud. Amid so much news of death, you have the word of life. After so many false promises, frustrated hopes, you have, Lord Jesus, the last word. And we have put all our trust in you. Alleluia, alleluia. Your truth will set us free. Alleluia, alleluia. Finally, we come to the creation station. You're invited to take out a journal, a notebook, or maybe an electronic device. Consider a friend, a neighbor, or a loved one. Hold them in your heart as you pray. Feel gratitude for them as you read these words from the Ephesians text that we heard earlier. Now receive these words of benediction and sending forth. Let us go forth into the world in gratitude and grace, giving thanks for all that God continues to do in, with, and for us here in this place. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen. Go in peace.